Good morning, Clearview, and welcome to church. My name is Cindy, and I have the privilege of doing the welcome today. If you've been with us for a while, or maybe this is your first time, we're glad that you're here. We pray that today's service will be a blessing to you. If you're looking for a church or you're looking for a place to worship, know that Clearview is always here for you. Uh, today we will be blessed by Colleen and the team with music. Uh, maybe go grab an instrument and you can join her with that and have some fun. Uh, if you don't have an instrument, no worries. Grab a box of pasta and shake that. Maybe grab a, uh, grab a pan and a wooden spoon and have fun with that. Lee is going to continue on with the series of Apocalypse Now. So make sure you have your Bibles close by and you can follow along with her. Let me just open up with prayer and then we can begin the service. Father God, you are an awesome God. And uh, we are thankful for this time that we get to meet. Thank you for this online platform where we just get to come together. Even if it's not in body, we get to come together in spirit. Lord, I pray that this service is a blessing to all who are watching it. I pray that um, we will be fed by your spirit. Help us to have a good time and to um, honor and glorify you in all that we do. In your name I pray. Amen. Enjoy the service. Hi there, Clearview Church. My name is Patty. I don't know if you recognize me behind this mask, but this is me. And I used to sit in that corner over there, typically before COVID began. But on September 13, we get to open our doors again and welcome the church back into the building. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. We have a couple things that we need to keep in mind before we move forward. And these requirements are typical, as you've noticed over the last few months. The government of Ontario has allowed for churches to have 30% capacity. That means in this worship center, we can have 31 bubbles, 31 bubbles. So if you are bubbling with somebody, you can register together. We'll go over some of the details in just a few minutes. We will have a hybrid, so keep in mind that while we gather together in person, we also have the opportunity to gather online via live streaming. So there are two options that we're going to uh, propose for the whole church so that you can be in person or continue to join us via our live stream. It's important to remember that we are part of this discipleship journey and so that we can be gathering together, whether digitally or here in the building. For those who wish to join us here in the building, there are some important steps to keep in mind. Here's the first one. First, we need to register for the service as space is limited. So 31 bubbles mean that you need to register using what we call Planning Center. There'll be more details in another video. Two, Sunday morning, this might be a little bit tough, but Sunday morning, if you've registered, you need to be here at 9.45. So 9.45 before 10 o'clock, we need to be here in the building. You will be coming to the front doors and an usher will bring you to a designated spot here in the worship center. And three, once you're in the worship center, we ask that you stay seated until the very end of the service. And at the end of the service, the ushers will also let us out and show us where we can go. So please, please remember, while we don't love these things and it's hard to recognize each other, we need to wear our masks. We need to wear our masks and we need to practice social distancing. Social distancing, as you know, is approximately two meters, six feet, or 11 Psalter hymnals lengthwise. So please keep your distance. We also understand that everyone has a certain level of comfort. So please keep in mind that people's comfort levels are different. Our services will be live streamed via YouTube, 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. So we're looking forward to seeing people, but we're also making sure that things are safe here. We look forward to seeing you. Please keep in mind that whether we are in person or we are online, you are part of the family here at Clearview and you belong. More than that, you are part of the body of Christ, Jesus Christ our Savior. Have a great day. Thank you. And smiling. Good morning, Clearview. Listen to this Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? 
but with you there is forgiveness. So that we can with reverence serve you, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Clear view, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. And he himself will redeem you from all your sins.
Point Clearview. My name is Daryl Van Lair. I'm a deacon here at Clearview. Today's offering is for Calvin Theological Seminary. Calvin Seminary's academic programs are designed to equip students with a foundation in Reformed Christian theology and focus on the church as God's agent of hope for the world. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Calvin Theological Seminary. Please continue to bless the professors as they influence the future leaders of the church. I pray for each pastor in training to be led by the Holy Spirit as they prepare sermons that will have a direct impact in people's lives. Amen. Hi everyone, my name is Elisa Rink. Um, I wish I could see your faces like you're seeing mine. I understand that there are plans underway for us to do just that. So uh, let's try and be patient. Um, I would like to lead you uh, in the reading of Psalm 46. And it's a psalm that seems to quiet my heart when I think about the scenarios that we find ourselves. Um, perhaps uh, in the midst of a challenging time, I'm really mindful of our teachers heading back to um, school with a whole set of new expectations and environments. Um, perhaps students going to school imagining um, the challenge of learning uh, while wearing a mask. Um, I also think of people who are um, newly uh, or perhaps have been unemployed for a couple of months or even longer than that and really struggling uh, financially. Um, and I also think of those people who are living in months of isolation and uh, we just want to connect specifically um, to you and uh, want to reassure you and remind you to reach out to Clearview um, as you're experiencing these things. Honestly, I'm a little bit fatigued uh, and tired of this world that COVID has created um, as I work full time and balance these new challenges that are right around the corner after Labor Day weekend, um, I honestly get bits of uh, worry and panic not knowing how all those details are going to uh, be ironed out. And yet, God reminds us again that he is very much in control. Um, so let's read Psalm 46. I'm reading from the NIV version. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. This is the best part. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still. That's the hard part for me. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so glad that you're in control, that you see me, that you see everyone watching this video now and in the future. You not only know what we're contending with, but you're right there working things ahead of me and right beside me for my good. Father, there are days when I'm not sure that I can handle more challenge. I know many people who feel that way. Will you come and remind us that you are not changed, that you are interceding for us, 
and help us to find new ways of daily um, living with you during this new time. Father, just like we lifted our frontline workers to you many months ago, we lift all those heading back into the classroom in your strong and loving and capable hands. Father, you have and will equip them. Bring them peace. Bring them reassurance in the midst of a system that may look and feel so different. Give them sleep. Holy Spirit, fall in their classrooms and in their office space and in their cars and in those moments especially where they wonder how they are going to manage. Father, we pray for passion, for teaching, for new ways to connect with your students and for joy. Father, I pray for Gerda Vanderlaan. Father, she's still dealing with a stroke and the side effects that are just slow to resolve. Father, work in her body. We pray that you would heal her with your presence, that you would um, give her new levels of patience and hope that you dearly love her and that you are working things out um, for her. Bring alongside people who help um, bring her the things that she needs. Father, I pray for the search committee. You are faithful to us as a congregation. Give our committee wisdom as they follow your leading in the process that you have laid out. We pray that you would bless the one that will be called and that you will prepare them Father, I pray for the plans underway to get us back together in our church building. Father, we're excited. We thank you for the plans underway. Give us wisdom um, and patience as we make all the arrangements. We pray for the staff that are charged with this, that you would um, lead them through. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to connect with each other like this. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you uh, for the extra long weekend for those of us who have three days off in a row. Give us rest. Um, And Father, join us uh, in this time. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. We're finishing our last week of our Apocalypse Now series. This entire summer we've talked about the way scripture points to the revelation of God. The word apocalypso throughout throughout scripture reveals a little bit about God and about God's world and his creation and his hopes and dreams for humanity. Um, And all of these different texts continue to speak into our reality today. Next week, we're going to be starting the Rechurch series. I mean, you're going to be not seeing a film, something filmed in, in a home. We're going to be back in the building. I thought it was only fitting that we started out our first week after the building was closed, March 29th, in my house. And we're closing it off here in my house. And our text this morning is Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 19. And it talks about the entire theme of Hebrews is the revelation of Christ. Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Jerusalem, those with Jewish identity and Jewish ethnicity, um, is encouraging them to view the resurrection of Christ as a beginning of a new custom, a new way of being. They were afraid that they were losing some of their traditions and losing some of the things that made them feel secure in their faith. And Paul was saying that the revelation of Christ matters, even though Christ is no longer with us physically. 
Before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of worship. It expands space and time. We just thank you for the technology that allows us to unite ourselves to you and to form ourselves into your body, worshiping you through computer screens, television screens. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to us, that it would soft, soften our hearts, and that he would give us the ears to hear all it is that you have for us. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate your words so that we could apply them to our lives? Would you give, give us real instruction that we can take away so that we can grow a little bit more into you tomorrow than we are today. Lord, I pray that your voice would be louder than all the others, including mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to start reading. Our text is Hebrews 13, but I'm going to start reading at Hebrews 12, 28. There's a natural break in the Greek that makes a little bit more sense and gives us a little context. So, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves are suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for your, our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And we do not forget, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men and women who must give an account. Actually, so that word men, it, it, it can say men or it can say men and women. We're not exactly sure if it was all one or the other. So I will say it can be either. They watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'd like to put you in the story these Jewish believers of Christ were meeting regularly in homes in Jerusalem. They shared meals together. They would have sat down to hear the story as the meal they were about to eat together was 
being prepared in the kitchen and the, the scents would have been wafting into the dining room. They would have been elbow to elbow with some non-Jews among their midst. And there was a longing in this church in Jerusalem. A little idea had started creeping in, a, a missing of the old ways. They were used to celebrating once a year this festival of atonement. We still celebrate it in um, Jewish culture today, it's Yom Kippur, and it was once a year where people would come into the temple and they would confess their sins and the high priest would take two goats and one would be a scapegoat, and one would be a goat to the Lord. And the goat to the Lord would be sacrificed, it would cleanse the, the altar. But the scapegoat would take the all of the spoken, intentional sins of the entire community. Now, the, the goat of the Lord would take all of the unintentional sins, so the, the things that they were did wrong that they didn't recognize were wrong. So it was kind of a a coverall um, sacrifice. But the scapegoat what was a symbol of all of the things that they knew they were doing. So as the, the, the priest would accept the prayers of the people, people would be thinking about the time that they were mad at their brother or where they were unfaithful to their spouse or where they cheated on their taxes, or they didn't live the way they were they should have been living. And the, the people would all think about these sins throughout the year, and then they would ceremonially place them, heap them all on to the head of the scapegoat. And the scapegoat would then be led out, to, out of the city. And at first it was enough that the, that the goat would be outside the city walls. But in Jerusalem, it was easy for that goat to come back in or maybe to be um, attracted to people. And so they began the tradition of pushing the scapegoat off of a cliff so that he could never get back into the city. And at the end of this festival, they felt free. They felt forgiven. They felt close to one another. They felt purified and cleansed. And they had this visible high priest that they could recognize, who they knew, who loved them, and it made them feel whole again. And at this time in the church, they were facing persecution, and it was not an easy time. And not only that, um, they might be subject to arrest or death, they were also ostracized from their Jewish communities. The thought of them calling non-Jews brothers and sisters meant that their own brothers and sisters no longer wanted anything to do with them. And they began to wonder, as Jesus wasn't returning as fast as they thought he would, whether they needed to go back to their old ways. Was it enough what he did when he was resurrected? Now, they, many of them saw Jesus directly. Many of them um, knew his disciples, so they may not have doubted his resurrection, but they doubted whether or not it mattered to them today. And I think we can see that in our own churches. We may not express the question, what does the apocalypse now mean? What does it mean to live the apocalypse? Like, what's, what's the difference? What is the fact that Jesus' resurrection, what difference does it make to us really today? We might not say that, but if you look at the statistics on church membership, it might reveal that our, an underlying cultural question. Because Paul says in Hebrews 13 that essentially that little group, that little church gathered because they inherited a kingdom that cannot be shaken, 
the revelation of God through Christ. It's their church that was the revelation of Christ to the world. You see, Paul was teaching them that they were essentially the apocalypse now. They were, the church was the embodiment of Christ in the world. How they acted towards one another, how they loved one another, was their witness to the world. Barna Group just uh, quite a few years ago did a study on youth and 60% of youth no longer go to church. And maybe they leave the church just for a time and a portion of them come back, um, usually when their kids are born or if they face a significant crisis, but many of them never come back. And the Barter Group asked these people, when the researchers asked why, why did they leave the church, many of them said they actually still love Jesus, but they just don't like his church. And they cited lots of reasons. Um, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, cited the judgmentalism or the um, historic oppression of the earlier church. And many of them even pointed to the abuse scandals of today. Now, in many ways, it's true. Those are real things that have plagued the church. And it may be that those youth haven't asked, what does the revelation of Christ mean to me today? But the truth is, the church is the body of Christ today. It is the revelation of Christ today. And so often when we look at a church, we're not looking for Christ. We're looking for sin. And frankly, if we're looking for sin, we're going to find it in the church because, as has been said many times before, it's full of people, so it must be full of sin because all people are sinful. And if we're only looking for sin, we're going to find it. But if we're looking for Christ, we have to look a little bit closer. And it involves something on our part. This is what Paul is talking to, to the church in Jerusalem. Is when you love each other and you keep on loving your brothers and sisters, something happens. When you love each other, verses 2 and 3, Paul sort of unpacks what that looks like. When you love each other, you, you don't forget to entertain foreigners as if they were angels or which is an Old Testament reference to Abraham and Lot. But Jesus says, if you, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. And so Paul would have been reminding them that when you're generous is when you love your brothers and sisters. And when you're remembering those in prison, those who are suffering and suffering right alongside when you're putting yourselves in the shoes of those who suffer and you give a little cost of yourself. You're loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. And later on, when Paul's talking about marriage and and keeping yourself from sexual immorality or, or keeping yourself from greed, what Paul is saying is that you, re- you remember, you live the revelation of Christ by being trustworthy, by being someone who keeps their covenants, by remembering who your provider is. You see, for these Jewish Christians, These were real issues that divided their communities. We have real issues that divide our communities today. Just take one look at um, 
social media this week there was a, a, a politician used scripture in a very questionable way and I'm not going to comment on what what I believe or not believe about this politician but it caused huge controversy and I read articles where on both sides of the debate people wrote that they weren't those kind of Christians. They've created a separation between one kind of Christian and another. And it doesn't just happen in the public sphere. It doesn't just happen on social media. We can see it happening in our own churches sometimes. We might pass by our fellow brother and sister in Christ, and maybe we're friendly, but our lives are not impacted by theirs. We may not even know if they're suffering because we haven't actually submitted to one another to share that part of our lives. Sure, we're close with some in the church because those are the people we're most comfortable with. Or maybe it's other churches, other denominations. Maybe we're comfortable with the churches that our parents said that we could love, but maybe there were other churches, other Christians, that maybe their customs were just a little too funny and we're, we're just a little susceptible, you're just a little bit um, suspicious. And so, I mean, we're, we don't hate them, but we don't, we could, we don't necessarily love them. Paul was casting a different kind of vision, understanding that Christ was the ultimate scapegoat. They didn't need to be worried about not being forgiven. They didn't need to wait until Yom Kippur to feel connected or close to one another. They could live it every single day of their lives. He cast a vision of life as a forgiven people who forgive. You see, it was hard for the Jewish Christians to accept non-Jews because they just had so many different customs. But but Paul's saying, it's not the food that that saves you. It's in verse 9, he says, it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. Their Jewish customs didn't save them. It was Christ that saved them. It was God's work in the atonement, the final atonement that ever needed to be done was done in Christ. And so because of that truth, we can live reconciled to one another. And Pastor Eric talked about that last week, that we can forgive one another. Now I want to take a little bit extra step beyond beyond that this week. Paul's talking about Jesus as the sacrificial goat, the final Um, the final sacrifice. And this image can be a really helpful way for us to actually live into that forgiveness principle. Because in reality, that bitterness that, that plagued the Jewish church can plague us too, and it can keep us from all the things that God wants for us in our lives. Because forgiveness can be hard. Let's say, for example, you have a family member who has a starkly different opinion from you, and it gets under your skin. Maybe maybe they live a way, they live their lives in a way that you just don't agree with. And it, every time you see them, it's something that just gets under gets at your gets at your craw. You know what I mean? We have an image here that Paul gives us. When we feel that we're owed something by someone, or when we observe sinful habits in others, there's nothing that we have to do about it for our own self, other than to lay those needs before Jesus. He's already taken that sacrifice. So, When your cousin from far away hurts your feelings in an argument, you don't need to wait for justification. You don't need to wait for the world to know you've been wronged. Or maybe the hurts that you've experienced in the Christian community have been deeper. You don't have to wait until you're proved right for vindication or redemption. 
you can actually give that to the Lord right now, every day. You don't have to wait for a time of a year. You can release everyone around you, every single person, every single situation from the debt that, that you have felt they owed you. We do this not through a ceremony, but through a daily offering of prayer. When our praises meet God, they do so through Christ. And so every single day, we have the opportunity to look at our our brother and sister and be reconciled to them and to God. So we let's, for example, think of that cousin who hurt us. Maybe we ask the Lord to forgive them. Or maybe we declare in prayer that that person no longer owes you anything. And then as the high priest office that we've been given through Christ, we can pray a prayer of blessing and abundance on even our worst enemies. We don't have to do that in a ceremony. We have it at our fingertips. We have it every single day of of our lives. We don't always, individually or collectively, offer a true reflection of Christ in the church. It's true. But whether we like it or not, thankfully, Christ loves us. And he promises his people that whatever rifts, whether they be ambivalent rifts or violent rifts, that he can take them. He's already taken them because he's taken them for you and he's taken them for I, for me. He's taken our sins and he's taken our offenses and he's already dealt with them. So he promises us that he can take any offenses that continue to happen. And so this morning, as we close out our series on Apocalypse Now, we can look at each other once again and say, you're the Apocalypse of Christ. And we could see Christ through the sin in, in others and in the church and in ourselves. Thank you, Clearview Church, for being the apocalypse of Christ. I can't wait until we can see each other again in person. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your church. Thank you so much for the offering and the sacrifice. Thank you for taking all of our offenses, taking all of our sins upon yourself. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in us to keep on loving each other. Lord, would you help us with this? Lord, if there are areas in our life that are bitter roots little seeds that keep coming back. Lord, would you bring those to mind and would you bring people around us that will help us? Would you bring us into mutual submission and accountability with one another so that we can live the flourishing, beautiful, purposeful lives that you've intended for your church? I pray for a blessing on your church. And I pray for a blessing on Clearview Church in the name of Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
another with a parting blessing, a benediction not unlike the way Paul would end his letters. They would send one another off out into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ to live their faith out day after day. And so as we sort of step out of our homes metaphorically and step back into the building of the church next week, I leave you with this blessing. The end of the of the chapter 13 of Hebrews, the end of the letter of Paul to the church in Jerusalem. May the God of peace, whom through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.
Hey there, uh, if you are watching this video, it's because you are interested in joining us for an in-person gathering for our Sunday morning services. Uh, in this video, I'm just gonna be kind of walking through the steps of how to register, where you can find this kind of information. Uh, let's just jump in. Um, so if you open up your web browser, I'm using a MacBook, and so I'm gonna be opening up Safari, but if you open up uh, Google Chrome or Internet Explorer, whatever that is, uh, you're just gonna type in www.clearviewchurch.com. Uh, this is our church's website. On this website, um, you've probably seen this before, there's lots of good stuff, but we're actually gonna focus up here on this register here button. So you can go ahead and click that. Uh, and this is gonna open up the Eventbrite page. Uh, Eventbrite is just, um, it's just allowing us to host um, you know, our, our ticket sales. We're not selling tickets, they're free. Uh, but we do need to register for the services. The reason we need to do that is uh, because we can only fit 31 social bubbles in our building right now. Um, and so Eventbrite allows us to register. You can register as a group. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, read through this page. This page has a lot of helpful information as you can see through all this. Uh, but when you're ready to register, you're just gonna click on this green register button right up here. Uh, once you click on that, um, you will be able to, you'll, you'll find this page where you can select how many people you are registering for. Uh, so for this sake, I'm just going to do two, um, and we will hit register. Um, at this point, it's fairly straightforward. Just drop your contact information in. Uh, so I'm going to put my name in here, and my email. Um, I'll have to confirm my email as well. And once you've got that settled up, you can click register here. And that is it. Um, that's what you have to do to register for a service. Um, you will get an email with the, the tickets. Uh, you don't need to bring those tickets along. You don't have to print them off. Uh, this is just for us to you know, reserve seats for folks and we can get a, get a feel for how many people are gonna be coming to our service. Um, now keep in mind, this registration only opens on Thursdays at midnight in the morning, I guess. Um, so if you try to come to this page before Thursday, uh, you, you'll be able to remind yourself. There's a little button that says remind me, uh, but you won't be able to actually register for the service yet. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're registering before Thursday, you won't be able to do that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us, uh, contact the church office, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to help. Uh, we're excited to see you in a service again soon. All right, see ya.